Our God, we just thank you so much for who you are. We thank you so much for all of what you're doing in our midst. As the scripture says, this is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our sight. Lord Jesus, would you show yourself lovely today, show yourself strong today, show yourself as the King of kings, Lord of lords, as our Savior, as our friend, as our counselor, as our everything, as our teacher. Holy Spirit, would you reveal the Son as your ministry is to testify of the Son, as a water reflects sunshine, you reflect and testify and reflect the Son. Show us Jesus today. Conform us more into his image and likeness. And Father, we thank you for loving us so much that you gave your Son so that all of this, all of this, all of this, all of this could be possible because it's bought with his precious, holy, and righteous blood. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for this day. We pray for all of those here that you would just meet each of us where we are. Please don't leave us where you find us. We pray for those watching online um, in other states, even in other countries, even overseas, just praying a blessing upon all of those that now are sitting still to hear your word. Lord, would you move me out of the way? Forgive me my many sins. I want to be a vessel meet for the master's use. Have your way, living water. Have your way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So today is one of those days where I have so many verses on my mind. You know, the scriptures liken to songs. It says in Psalms 119, your statutes, your word, have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. It's saying, Lord, as I'm walking through this dry and weary land, your verses, your promises, they're like songs I sing as I'm navigating this crazy world. The scriptures are like in the song. So kind of like when someone says to you, hey, play your favorite song. You ever just, I mean, when's the last time someone's asked you to play your favorite song? And it's kind of like, well, I, you know, let me play you three. Well, let me play you five. Or you start playing one and halfway through, no, nah, no, nah, 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 this is my favorite song. No, 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 this is my favorite song. So now you understand how when the preacher gets up and we say Palm Sunday, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem where he would go and be nailed to my cross, the cross I deserve, Barabbas, the murderer, the rapist murderer that was set free, as Jesus was condemned to be crucified, that cross, when it was hewn down in the woods and fashioned into being an instrument of execution, the wood was not hewn down with Jesus in mind. It was hewn down with two thieves and a third thief named Barabbas. It means son of the father, but it's not son of the father of lights. It is son of his father, the devil, but Barabbas was freed, and Jesus was nailed to Barabbas' cross. You see, you and I are Barabbas. We are the ones who have walked as children of disobedience, children of rebellion. If you look at Lucifer's fall in Ezekiel 28, him lifted up because of his pride, him wanting to have control over everything, him not wanting to bow to God and rebelling against God, that's like reading your own biography. In fact, you could put your name right in to Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, and find that when you're reading of Lucifer's rebellion, it looks just like yours. When you're reading of what Lucifer said in his heart, it looks just like what we say in our heart. We are the children of the father, the father of rebellion, of Lucifer. We are Barabbas, but we were set free, and Jesus was nailed to our cross. So when we talk about Palm Sunday, when we talk about the day when Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem, and they laid down palm branches. And we're going to get into that today. And at the end of service, we actually have a palm branch for everyone. We even will have people after service in the overflow room, and they will show you how to take a palm branch and actually origami it. Can I use origami as a verb? How to origami it into a cross. But that's why when we're talking about a day like today, and I have just a series of verses here in my two pages of notes, it's like, well, where do I begin reading? Where do I begin reading? Well, I think I'll begin with Isaiah 61. And forgive me in advance if after reading it, I'm scratching my head wondering what song to play next. But I do promise that by God's grace at the end of this message, you get to hear all my favorite songs. And I'm praying and already 
knowing that they're going to be your favorites too. So let's look in Luke chapter 4. Jesus, beginning his public ministry, goes into the synagogue in Capernaum, or rather in Nazareth. And as was the custom with traveling teachers, traveling preachers, a.k.a. traveling rabbis, there was an invitation given if anyone had something to say. Jesus is acknowledged. Jesus is given the scrolls because this was a time when not everyone had their Bible the way we just hold it up. You went to the synagogue to hear the scriptures read. And Jesus was handed the scriptures. And everyone is looking at this humble carpenter's son, right, from Nazareth, not knowing where he would go. Where does one go? What would be his favorite song, if you will? And he shocks everyone, Luke chapter 4 tells us, because he turns to Isaiah 61. (laughs) And this is what he reads. He says, and picture this moment, and picture Jaws dropping here in Bama, backwoods, northern Galilee, where there was a twang in the accent. That's why even when the woman approached Peter when Jesus was later arrested, she said, you're a Galilean, I could tell by your accent. It was backwoods, fisherman country. You know, like I said, if you saw the movie Gladiator, and when you see, you know, uh, Maximus just wanting to go home where the wheat grass went through his fingertips, that's very much what Galilee still looks like if you go there to this day. Where's Jesus going to turn when they hand him the scrolls? Can you imagine that not in the religious seminaries in Jerusalem, not in the academic institutions in Jerusalem and Judea, but in backwoods, back corner, country Galilee, an itinerant preacher is given the scrolls and he reads this. Are you ready? He says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. (laughs) They knew this was the messianic set of verses that when the Messiah, the Mashiach came, that this is what only one would be able to claim this. Only one would be able to read this. And while anyone could read it, only one would be able to read it and hit his own chest while he's reading it. And he says this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Can you imagine that? Like, did he just hit his chest? Is he just reading it? Or is he saying it's him? Oh, they're going to get it. The spirit of the Lord is on me. Because God has anointed me, anointed Christos. When we say Jesus Christ, it is Jesus Christos. Christ is not his last name. Christos means the anointed one. It is this one. He says, yo, because the Lord has anointed me, he has Christos me to preach good tidings to the meek. Good news. Good news. Why is there good news? The gospel means good news. Why is there good news? There's good news because there's bad news. The bad news is that because of the fall in the garden, we are all born in sin. The Bible says that while the wages of work get you a certain pay, the wages of sin get you the payment of death, a.k.a. eternal separation from God. So the bad news is that everyone is born a sinner and is ripe for the just judgment of God and eternal separation from God in hell. That's the bad news. But the good news is that while God must judge all sin and while God hates all sin, God loves the sinner. And he loves the sinner so much that he promised all the way back in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3.15 that he would send forth a Savior to save us, the Messiah, the messianic hope of a deliverer, of a Savior from sin and from death and from hell was given all the way back in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3.15. They have waited and waited, and now Jesus stands and reads, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Can you imagine the one who was just dozing off just sits up? And the whole room, the whole, can, and then, I mean, God in the flesh, the one who spoke and said, let there be light, is now standing in the room. And you can imagine just the whole atmosphere changes. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord God has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound 
to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all them that mourn. At that point in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, he simply shut the scrolls, or rather rolled the scrolls, handed it back, sat down, it tells us in Luke 4, 18 and 19, and said this, this day is the scriptures fulfilled in your ears. Whoa. See, it, it, you, when you really look at Jesus to be who he is, you can't fail but just be in awe of even the simplest story. We didn't read of him raising Lazarus just now. We didn't read of him, you know, giving sight to the blind. We didn't just read of him casting out 2,000 demons. We just simply read with a hungry heart of Jesus just having a Bible study, just reading two verses and sitting down, and you see the awe that's even fallen upon us. But then the verse goes on. Verse 3 to appoint them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes. Would you underline that? This is what the gospel has done for us. This is what new life has done for us. This is why Holy Week, this is why us celebrating Holy Week, beginning with Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the donkey, them laying down the palm branches, to Jesus being crucified for our sins, buried, raising again on the third day, which we will be celebrating next Sunday on Resurrection Sunday. This is what we are celebrating. He has given us beauty for ashes. He has given us the oil of joy for mourning. He has given us the garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. Do you remember? Isn't that just a beautiful way to coin it? Wow, I love how you can read verses and you're like, wow, I just read my biography in three words. A spirit of heaviness. <laughs> wow, never mind like a 300-page book called Eyes That Seen Plenty. I just found my life story in three words. A spirit of heaviness. Maybe I should, anyway, you know, a spirit of heaviness. And it says that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. And I love this. As it continues, just speaking of just the work of the gospel, please look at this, Isaiah 61, verse 4. And they, who's they? The redeemed ones, those who have invited Christ into their heart as Lord and Savior, those who are walking in gospel glory. What is the fruit of being a new creature in Christ? What is the fruit of what happens when you go from being a child of the devil to being a child of God through the work of Jesus on the cross? What happens? They, underline they, that refers to me, that refers to you, that refers to us, and they will build the old waste places. The Lord redeems, though he can't change, and he doesn't, ch no, I, can't, I can't say can't, though he doesn't change the past, he changes us so that we can bring the lemons of the past and let him turn them into lemonade. Look at this. They will build the old wastes. They will raise up the former desolations and they will repair the waste cities and underline this, the desolations of many generations. While I do not believe the Bible teaches generational curses, Ezekiel chapter 18 clearly, clearly debunks that. There are no generational curses, but there is generational baggage. There is generational affliction. There is a generational family culture, stagnating strongholds. You can inherit not just uh, uh, bad health and maladies genetically. You can inherit unhealthy family dynamics, unhealthy strongholds. Um, the same way the enemy works in a family is the same way it can continue to work to make you think it is a generational curse. It's just that there has just been an open door for the enemy to have a certain way, and that open door continues to pass down. But this is what the gospel means. It says here, rebuilding the desolations of many generations. When you give your life to Jesus, you know, that generational ungrace comes to an end, and now grace begins for the generations after. So while we don't believe in generational curses, we do celebrate how the gospel brings changes where generational stuff, and think of your own family, of just generational things that always seem to pop up in every generation. Generational behavior that seems to pop up in every single generation. Generational strongholds. And then people say stuff like, well, this runs in our family. Well, this runs in our family. So present that you almost would think it does run in your family. It does. It is ungrace. But what does the gospel do? Along with beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, God uses us and also gives us front row seats 
to seeing the rebuilding of the desolation that's occurred over many generations in our families. Isn't that amazing? So this is what we're celebrating, and what we want to do now is we want to go to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21, and we're actually going to start um, at verse 1. Today is Palm Sunday. Today is when we are going to really look at the Holy Week. And while today lays the foundation, next Sunday we will look at the crucifixion and the resurrection. Today we are looking at what has traditionally been grouped into a seven-day period. It's called Holy Week because we're looking at what traditionally is give or take seven days of Jesus riding into Jerusalem and within that seven days, crucified, buried, and then resurrects on the third day. So this is Holy Week. And I pray that may this be a Holy Week we just won't forget. May this be a Holy Week that we will treasure. May this be a Holy Week where or even a Palm Sunday where just something deep has happened in our hearts that uh, maybe we can't recall when, when such an experience has happened. Would, would you like to experience that? Are you hungry for that? It says his mercies are new every morning. I mean, do you stand in a place right now where you could really use an overhaul of your heart, where you could just use a fresh dose of just Holy Spirit excitement, a recharge, even a new beginning in just how you perceive Jesus? Because here's the thing you learn about the Christian walk. When your vertical is correct, your horizontal will always be correct. When you see Jesus correctly, you will always see everyone around you correctly. When you see Jesus incorrectly, when the vertical is off is when the horizontal always tends to be off. The solution for everything, if we were all to list just where we would like to see change and what we would like to see in us, in, around us, it all begins with how we see Jesus so would you like your vertical just realigned today? Kind of like going to the chiropractor and you get, you know, your vertebrae realigned. Who would just like a realignment with really just seeing Jesus for who he is? Amen? Amen. So Matthew 21, and let's read. It says, And when they drew nigh to Jerusalem and were come near to Bethphage unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, and he said to them, verse 2, Go into the village over against you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if any man says anything to you, ye shall say, look at this, the Lord has need of them. And immediately the man will send them. You know, it says in John, Jesus did so many miracles that if they were all to be recorded, all the books of the world would not even be enough pages this is a miracle even right here. He says, you know, go into that village. Uh, when you get there, you're going to see a donkey there. And interestingly, Jesus, right as he's saying that, the master of the donkey might have actually just been walking right out there tying him up, not even knowing why. Might have been on his way to take the donkey to the store, caught a charley horse, went back, tied it up, went inside nursing his charley horse. Then he says, and when you're unloosing the donkey, if anyone comes out and says, yo, what you doing? That's my donkey. Just say this, the master needs the donkey. And it says, yeah, and then the man's going to be like, Cool, no problem, and go back to whatever he was doing. This is a miracle even right here. Are we looking for his glory in all the pages, or are we still just reading it as, uh, you know, kind of like the, the, the trailers before the movie? Like, you know, the, the movie happens when he really gets arrested and everything. No, this is everything with Jesus is always the climax of the movie. Everything. So it says here in verse 4, all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, your king comes unto thee, meek and sitting upon a donkey, and a colt and the foal of a donkey. You see, while Jesus came and fulfilled many Old Testament prophecies, there actually was a university, uh, a mathematician at a university that actually did a study on if you look at the hundreds of prophecies that Christ fulfilled from the Old Testament, what would be the chances that someone could just randomly, just coincidentally fulfill even just a score of them? They did the math and found that the chances of someone just even fulfilling just, just a score, just a dozen to 20 of them, just coincidentally, would be 1 times 10 to the 187th power. 
one in a million is one times 10 to the six. One in a billion is one times 10 to the ninth. They found that it was one times 10 with 187 zeros. It is impossible. It is absolutely impossible that anyone could have coincidentally fulfilled all the prophecies. Well, what were the prophecies? Well, let's go through some of them. Genesis chapter 49 tells us that the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah. Deuteronomy 18 tells us the Messiah would come in the prophetic uh, strength and anointing similar to Moses as he led the Israelites out of Egypt. Isaiah chapter 53 says he would be born in poverty. Isaiah says that his beard would be ripped out, that he would be spit upon, that his back would be scourged. Psalm 22 says that he would be crucified when crucifixion was not even invented yet as a form of capital punishment. It says in Psalm 22 that they would gamble for his clothing. It says in Psalm 22 that from the cross, he would cry out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But if we back up even more, Isaiah chapter 7, 14 said that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. Micah chapter 5, verse 2 says the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 said the Messiah would make his triumphal entry riding a donkey. Can I just ask you a question? What type of animal would you... Uh, ride in to make your triumphal entry on. And of all the animals of the animal kingdom, and we clearly see, even with the flood, that God clearly just tapped the migration button in every animal in the animal kingdom. God obviously owns everything in the cattle on a thousand hills. Any animal. It could have been any animal. It could have been a rhinoceros with the world's record of a horn. With a dozen gorillas, silverbacks, just in absolute stride, just walking in with him. And then the horse just in the back holding up the rear, but he's riding on a rhinoceros. It could have been a, just a score of just exotic peacocks and albino flamingos and everything else, just an array. Of, it could have made, he could have had the entire animal kingdom going just as when they marched to the ark because he is the ark of God. And what does he ride in on? He rides in on a donkey. He rides in on a donkey. It was the, the, the symbol, just the symbol of just menial service. He comes in meek, rides in on a donkey, but he's fulfilling Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Another sign of the Messiah is that he would ride in on the donkey. So, verse 6, it says, And the disciples went, and they did as Jesus commanded them. And they brought the donkey and the colt, and look at this, they put on them their clothes. There was no saddle. These were uh, animals that had never been ridden on before. They put their clothes, they took, meaning their coats and shawls, and they laid it on top of the animal, and they set him thereon. Verse 8, and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way now. Underline a very great multitude. And others, it says, laid down branches from the trees, and they strawed them in the way. If you write down John chapter 12, verse 13, it's not pine branches. It's not uh, cedars from Lebanon branches. It is actually palm branches. The palm branch was a symbol of victory. You'll find if you do a word study just on the palm branch, the palm tree, and actually it's different than our palm as we see it. If you go to Israel, a palm branch is, or a palm tree rather, is, it's really a date palm. So if you've ever had dates, um, these are palms that bring forth dates. They stand about 100 feet tall. They live to be about 1 to 200 years old. They're everywhere. And one of the most beautiful sights is just riding through the desert. And then in the middle of the desert, you just come upon just, just groves of just palm branches. And then you see just gazelle and antelope, or elan rather, are just moving all through, you know, ibis is what I meant to say. Exodus 15, 27, when the Lord brought them out of Egypt into the wilderness, he takes them to an area that was just lined with palm branches, always communicating to them victory. Deuteronomy 34, verse 3, said the land of milk and honey that he would take them to would be a land that would be loaded with palm branches. It was always a symbol of victory. In fact, if you write down Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, and this is the verse that we love Revelation 7, verse 9, the heavenly vision says that, behold, I saw in heaven, and we could see it here, 
multitudes that no one could number from every nation, tribes, peoples, languages, standing before the Lord and the throne and before the Lamb. And then it says, and they all had palm branches in their hand. In heaven, we will hold palm branches. The palm branch is a symbol of victory. Now, isn't it interesting that, and, and it's scary too, how many will go to church today, receive a palm branch, go home, maybe even origami it into a cross, and it will be a day of no awe. It will just be a day of religious routine. It will just be a day where it was just a great service and perhaps the coffee and the fellowship afterwards is highlighted more than Jesus and the word uh, or the church culture or the play put on or whatever it is. And all those things have their place, but this should sober all of us up. How many will go to church today, recognize it as Palm Sunday, celebrate Palm Sunday, be taught about the palm branch, even walk out with a palm and not even make the sweet connection of a deeper intimacy with the Jesus that gives us the victory that we have. Today is a message for who really wants to fall in love again with the promises of victory that Jesus gives us. Who wants to fall in love again with the gospel? Who wants to fall in love again with the promises of God? Who really wants to be rocked? Whatever parts of your heart have just, that used to be faith-filled are now fear-filled. Whatever parts of your heart that used to be determination-filled are now filled with uh, doubt. Whatever parts of your heart that used to be stirred up are now stagnated. Who is there today that really says, you know what, I really want to, Get back to keeping the main thing the main thing, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the greatest story ever told, the greatest love story, and the story that saved my soul. As we lift up the greatest story ever told, you know what you'll notice? Other stories begin to diminish. Because here's the reality. People come in church after a week worth of movies, a week's worth of reading this and following current events and other stories and the world is ooing and eyeing and uh, everything else and making all of its own idol shepherds and its own, you know, idol saviors. And we can fall in the trap of being in awe of all the other news flash, all the other stories, marveling at what the world marvels at. And then we come here and because we have other stories lifted up, this just becomes a story among other stories, news among other news. That's why the Lord God says, I am the Lord your God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. It doesn't mean him first and the other story second. It's him first and there's nothing else even in the conversation. Can we get back to that today? And that's what Palm Sunday is all about. And let's keep reading. So a great multitude, verse 8, spreads their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from trees. And again, we said John chapter 12, verse 13, tells us these are palm branches. They're putting down the branches that speak of victory. So just imagine, here he is on this donkey, sitting on garments instead of a saddle, riding, and a great multitude is just praising him. And they're laying down their garments. They're laying down everything that they would hold dear and they're casting it as nothing because they're seeing Jesus as everything. They're laying garments down to make like a, basically a royal red carpet, if you will, made up of just what they're wearing. It means that I would take my jacket off right now, okay? Uh, I would take off whatever. You would take off whatever right now you have. You would count it as nothing suddenly and you would just lay it down. And then imagine as you just watch Jesus, God in the flesh, on the donkey, and you just count it an honor that the hoof of the donkey that God is riding riding on just stepped on your coat then you debate man do I put it back on or do I leave it here as holy forever but man if I put it back on yo you know it's going to be so special and then you know someone goes to wipe off the hoof print you're like what are you doing man leave that yo man Jesus that's the hoof print I mean can you imagine this a great multitude spread their garments in the way others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way and the multitude that went before and that followed cried, saying, and they're now crying out, Psalms 118, verse 26. They cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna is a Hebrew word that means save and rescue us. Save and rescue us. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved. The whole city was moved. Now, please understand that Deuteronomy 16, 16, write down that verse. 
How many Jewish feasts were there in total? Seven. Seven is the number of completion, so no surprise that there were seven Jewish feasts. The first half of them actually were types of the first coming of Christ. The second half of them are actually types of the second coming of Christ. That's a study we can get into at some point. We have done it before, um, and if you search our archives, you'll find it. But Deuteronomy 16.16 16 tells us that there were three feasts that were mandatory that all Jewish males around the world had to go to Jerusalem to celebrate in person. It was Passover, it was Pentecost, and it was the Feast of Tabernacles. So therefore, the city during this time would go from being one or 200,000 people to 2 to 2.5 million people. Now you understand the crowd at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell on the 120 at the upper room. Now you understand how thousands are listening to Peter and 3,000 get saved at his first sermon, 5,000 get saved at his second sermon. Now do you see when it says the whole city was moved, the city is now swole with people. And it says when he was coming to Jerusalem, verse 10, the whole city was moved saying, who is this? And the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Verse 8, it says a great multitude laid down their garments, laid down their branches. It says a great multitude, verse 9, went in front of him and followed. So you had a great multitude in the front shouting that he was coming, a great multitude behind, you know, also praising him. Who is this great multitude? Who would you choose to be your entourage as you made the entrance as King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and the King of Glory? Would it be the religious elite? Would it be the 1% of the movers and shakers? Would it be the influencers? Would it be the ones that had the most likes and the most views on YouTube? Would it be the ones that had the most likes in all social media? Who would you choose to actually go in? Would it be just the ones that knew how to make everything go viral and just make it all trend? What would you choose? Just curious. You know who Jesus' multitude is? Lazarus, who's raised from the dead. The woman of the night, the prostitute that came and cried over his feet and washed his feet with her hair. No doubt the man who had 2,000 demons cast out of him, even though Jesus told him, go back to your city and tell everybody about what is done. I'm sure if he could make it, I don't, I don't know if a... If a, if a a junkyard full of pit bulls would have kept him from getting here. Mary Magdalene, out of whom came seven demons. And religious leaders who had to embrace their own religious hypocrisy and in a culture that was puffing men up, had to humble themselves and bow their knee to him as Lord. A great multitude. Those at the pool of Bethesda. The man who in John chapter 5 is crippled for 38 years and Jesus heals him and then says, sin no more lest something worse happen to you. Tradition tells us that he was crippled because of a sexually transmitted disease. That's why Jesus says to him, don't sin again or something worse will happen. Jesus is essentially saying, he's not saying if you do it again, I'm going to really hit you. He's saying, no, if you do it again, it may actually be worse. If you play with fire again, you might get burnt worse. Tradition says he was, he was crippled with a STD. Do you think this man was here? This is the multitude praising the Lord. You see, in God's eyes, all have sinned and fallen short of his glory. There is none righteous, no, not one. So when the Lord, even though our world looks at who's more clean and less clean and more this and more that, the Lord sees all who have fallen short of his glory. So the Lord just sees a multitude, just trophies of his grace praising him. Let's go well, let's to Luke now. 19 now. We're going to go to Luke 19, and then we're going to try to work our way right back here. Let's add some more backdrop to the story. Let's go to Luke 19, and let's read verse 28. And what's beautiful is you know that there are four different gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels because there's very much a similarity to them. They really follow more or less the chronology of our Lord from earliest years to the beginning of his public ministry to the cross there's a similarity in their presentation john stands different because john's not really giving you the progression of jesus's life it's just giving you seven miracles seven i am statements it's a book of sevens that's just providing and really giving to the church jesus as god as the god man right so 
when you read the Gospels, some accounts are in all four. Some accounts might only be in one. This triumphal entry, of course, it makes sense that it would be in all four Gospel accounts. Let me just give you all four. Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. I encourage you to read all of them and then look at which ones are different. And just like if four of us went to a football game, if four of us went to the cheesesteak spot, we would be telling the same story, but according to how we're wired, some would bring out details that the others might leave out and whatever. As you read the gospel accounts, you see just little bits of information that are different. So Matthew 21, 1 through 11. Mark 11, verses 1 through 11. Luke 19, verses 28 through 44. And then John 12, verses 12 through 19. It is John that tells you that those were palm branches, while some of the other gospel accounts will just tell you they laid down branches, right? So now we're in Luke 19. Let's look at 28 through 44. And it says, And when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. You'll always see in the scriptures you go up to Jerusalem because you literally went up a mountain to go to Jerusalem. Similar to in Philadelphia, they call Germantown and Mount Airy uptown because as you leave Broad Street and turn on Germantown Avenue, you're literally going up. Literally, when you went to Jerusalem, the only way was to go up. You get on Germantown Avenue, you know you're going up a hill. When you went up to Jerusalem, you went up. So it always was going up to Jerusalem. So it says, when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. And he said, go into the village over against you. At your entering, you're going to find a colt tied that a man never sat on before. Loose him and bring him to me. And if any man asks you, why do ye loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, because the Lord has need of him. And they that were sent went their way, and they found it even as, they, as he had said. And as they were loosing the colt, verse 33, the owner did come out and say, what are you loosing the colt for? Verse 34, they said, the Lord has need of him. Isn't, it's no different in our Christian walk. Isn't the Christian walk just a matter of repeating what Jesus says? In the face of lies, in the face of doubts, in the face of uh, enemies' attacks, in the face of whatever it is, slander of men or whatever, just repeating what the Lord says? All Eve had to do in the garden when the enemy tempted her about the tree of life was do what? Just repeat what God had said. God said, I shall not touch it. They basically just said what the Lord told them to say. They didn't try to spice it. They didn't try to add it up, modernize it or anything. They just said what he told them to say. The Lord has need of them. Let's fall back in love with just saying the Lord said it and just quoting his word is enough. Amen? For whatever your situation is, whatever you're going through, just saying what he tells you to say. Right? So they said to the man, the Lord has need of him. And what did the man do? The man let him take it, just as Jesus said. And verse 35, they brought him to Jesus, they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as they went, they spread their clothes in the way. Now, interesting that Luke leaves out the palm branches, but the other gospel writers have it, and even tells you in John that it's a palm branch. They spread their clothes in the way. When he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. I mean, again, just imagine, now it says they're not just praising him. Luke tells you they're praising him for the mighty works they had seen. I mean, can you imagine, you know, a woman standing there with a son, you know, who was raised from the dead, and she, as he rides by, is just telling people like, you see this boy? He was dead. Jesus raised my, everyone is just screaming out all of what Jesus had done and all of what they had seen. Do you still get excited over your testimony? Do you still get excited over what Jesus has done? Do you still sing from the rooftops all of what God has done in your heart, all of what God is doing in your life, all of the deliverances God is doing, all of the blessings, the new discoveries? Do you still pause to share what he's doing? Is it still your favorite thing to talk about? Is it still your favorite thing to talk about? And is it still your favorite thing to hear others talk about it? We're living in a day where not only is isolationism and individualism at an all-time high, but people are losing their devotion, and you could tell the devo devotion is getting lost because the devotion to the things of God is getting lost. 
People in the scriptures loved praising God, rehearsing what God has done, and hearing others rehearse what God has done. Matter of fact, Acts 15 tells you they wouldn't even have council meetings without first giving time for testimonies. But look at where we are today. You can't talk for 10 minutes without somebody looking at their watch. What's going on? Where are we? Where have we moved? There's one answer. It's idolatry. We want to come to church, and then we want to be able to run off back to our idols. Just like the Lord of the Rings, we leave our precious at the door, our little ring, whatever that is, and we want to get out of here and pick up that precious and get right back down to just singing little weirdo love songs. Weirdo love songs. I like that. Weirdo love songs to our precious. Let's regain the wonder of who Jesus is. Here is his royal entry. This is our Jesus so it says they began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed be the king that comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said to the master, Rebuke your disciples. Basically, they knew the, that their multitude is singing Psalms 118 verse 26. That's, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Hosanna, save us. You know that song we sing? This is the day. That actually is the messianic song talking about this day of Jesus riding in. How many of you didn't know that? Isn't it beautiful? That's why we come to church. We get to learn new things. So they're singing, the day is there. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Hosanna, save us. The Pharisees hear them singing this because the psalms were set to music, they hear them singing this and realize that they're calling Jesus God. So they say, rebuke your disciples, meaning, yo, don't let them just call you God like that. You're just going to stay on the donkey? People are calling you God. Multitudes of people are calling you God. Wow. You know, religiosity in church kills and sends people to hell maybe faster than, than Skid Row. These are people that handled the scripture, knew the scripture, but didn't know God, didn't know Jesus. All they knew was religion, and they were so high-minded in it that they didn't, they didn't want to give up the limelight even when God came and asked for it. They said, rebuke your disciples. And look at what he says. He answered and said unto them, I tell you, if these hold their peace, the stones will immediately cry out. He's like, if they don't praise me, he answers the question. Look at how he answers it. He doesn't answer it by saying, yo, I'm God. He says, if they don't praise me, the rocks that I made will praise me. I mean, what a way to just say you're God in the most universal, gargantuan, unfathomable way, like, yo, my rocks will cry out. He just basically said, not only am I God, but I'm God that spoke the rocks into existence. I spoke into existence what you're standing on, and if they don't praise me, what I created right under your feet will praise me. Yo, he gave them more than their answer. Right, let's keep reading. But look at this. Are you ready? Can you picture the scene now? Can you really picture? Do you feel like you're there? That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that when we really get in the Word and the Holy Spirit has his way, we should come to life. Warren Wearsby said that a good preacher should be able to turn ears into eyes. Do you feel like you're there now? Do you feel like you see it? Well, then praise God, because if this donkey on this stage was able to do that, that is only proof that God is alive. Let's keep reading, all right? It says that when he was come near, though, and saw the city, you see the Mount of Olives sits here, right? My family, I was able to take them to Israel for my second trip last year as I taught on a biblical tour, got to baptize them in the Jordan River. Um, the Mount of Olives sits here. There's a slight decline. Well, actually, it's more than slight. It's a pretty intense decline. Matter of fact, uh, picture the treadmill on the ultimate incline. Uh, multiply that incline times five on the treadmill, and now you have what it's like to walk down the Mount of Olives into the Kidron Valley and then right up into Jerusalem. Uh, it is very much just a, a walk of, I don't know, a quarter mile. It's not down and up. But look at this. As he goes over the Mount of Olives and this parade of praise is following him, look at the detail that Luke gives us. It says that when he was come near and beheld the city, have you ever seen pictures when, everyone, when, when someone goes to Israel, they always take the picture standing with the dome of the rock and the white limestone of Jerusalem city behind them, right? Right? You see the gold dome of the rock and the limestone city. How are they doing that? It looks like it's right behind them. No, they're standing on the Mount of Olives, 
right down the Kidron Valley, and at about the same height is the city of Jerusalem right behind them. So the same way you see the city of Jerusalem behind that photo that's famous, everyone that goes to Israel takes that picture, when Jesus comes up and sees the city in that same view, look at what he does. It says he wept over it. The Greek says he burst into tears. Yo, Jesus is riding on the donkey. They're praising him. And what is he doing? The Greek says he is crying audibly. It means he is boo-hooing as he is riding. Look at this. God Almighty, the God of glory, on a donkey that no one ever rode on, using people's jackets for a saddle, riding on garments as a royal red carpet over palm branches with a multitude of a motley crew praising him. And when he sees the city in the most jubilant moment, he, he is boo-hooing. The Greek is he is weeping audibly. You hear him crying above the praise. And why is he boo-hooing? Because he sees the fickleness of man, he sees the rebellion of man, and he sees that even in this moment, <clears throat> his people are going to reject him. And he begins lamenting over it. He is broken hearted over it. You see, what the Bible teaches us is the heart of God. Jesus said, I've come to show you the Father. You're like, what is my heavenly Father like? How does my heavenly Father feel? Jesus said in John 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. As you study Jesus, you get to know more about your daddy. And then you get to replace who your heavenly daddy is with any earthly daddy issues you may have. Your mind is getting renewed. The more you know Jesus, the more you know your daddy. How does the Father feel in the face of his rebellious people? It breaks his heart. He is a God that will judge but he delights in mercy. People will be sent to hell, but he delights in mercy. He's not willing that any should perish. But as sure as he is righteous and true, people will go to hell if they choose to reject Jesus. He is weeping over it. And what does he say in verse 42? If you had only known, even thou, at least this thy day, the things that belong to your peace, but now they are hid from your eyes. You notice what he just did? He held them accountable for not knowing that day. He's holding them accountable for not recognizing that day. Do you know why? Because Daniel, among the other messianic prophecies, do you remember in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, one of the greatest Old Testament prophecies? Daniel predicted not only the second coming of Christ, but gave what's called the 70-week prophecy, where if you do the math and look at the amount of lunar years, take note of our own leap years and pull them out and start counting from the rebuilding of the wall of Nehemiah in 445 BC and looking at the moons to know what date it was and count forward, it will actually be 69 weeks or 483 years down to the day, some 183,000 days down to the exact day they had the scriptures, and they could have known this very day, and he's holding them accountable for not knowing the day. If you want to get a book, there's a book called The Coming Prince by Sir Robert Anderson. He was a detective for Scotland Yard in uh, the UK. He was a believer who was a professional detective for Scotland Yard. He actually went to the Greenwich Observatory. He actually went to the observatory to look at the full moons to know what dates fell on what days of full moons, looked at the Jewish feast days, went back to know the exact date when Nehemiah started to build the wall, and then went forward to looking at what day the Passover must have fallen on in this year of some 32 A.D and actually found that it actually is Daniel's 70-week prophecy. It actually is 483 years. It actually is some 183,000 plus plus to the day. He was knighted for that work by the Queen of England. It's called The Coming Prince by Sir Robert Anderson. That is why Jesus is weeping. He's weeping that people, he's coming unto his own, and all he sees is people playing church. 
He comes into his own, and all he sees is that people are using church as a cloak for them to pop their own collar. People are just using church as a cloak just so they sleep better at night. People are just using church as a cloak just for networking. People are using church as a cloak just as a place to show off their abilities. People are using church as a cloak just for their own selfish ends and not looking at the one who is the king of it all and saying, Lord, speak. What would you have your servant to do? Lord, you love me and I love you back. And love is not spelled L-O-V-E. Love is spelled S-A-C-R-I-F-I-C-E. Lord, you've sacrificed it all for me. May I know your heart and learn to sacrifice it all for you. And when he comes, all he sees is church, churchiness, religion. You know, it tells us in Luke's gospel that when Jesus was born, in Luke chapter 2, verse 7, that Jesus had to be born in an alley because there was no room in the inn. There was no room. It was full of people hustling and bustling, and the world was being taxed, and commerce, and the ones that could get there quicker got the best rooms. You know, so when Mary was with child, she had to give birth to Jesus in an alley and lay him in a feeding trough, not a little manger with a, a puffy pillow, right? It was actually a feeding trough because Luke chapter 2, verse 7 says there was no room in the inn. Isn't it sad that when he was born, there was no room in the inn? And now Jesus is weeping because when he rides into Jerusalem, there's no room in people's hearts because they're just full of religion. They're just full of religion. Let's go back to Matthew, and this is where we're going to begin our first of the series of 19 closings. If you go back to Matthew 21 now, what does Jesus do when he enters in? He's weeping audibly at the sight of religion. There's no room for Jesus. There's no room. There's no one saying, what is the pulse of heaven? There's no one saying, what is the Holy Spirit saying? Let us be still and hear the sweet words of the Spirit. Everyone knows everything. Everyone knows what to do. Everyone's a know-it-all. There's no room for him when he goes there. And wherever the Lord is not, it is a vacuum for humans to bring in every nasty thing that we are just capable of doing even when we don't mean to do it. So what happens when he enters in? Would you go to Matthew 21? And would you go to verse 12? It says, when Jesus went into the temple of God, what did he find? He found people in there making merchandise of the things of God. You see, remember, Deuteronomy 16, 16, this was one of the feasts that every Jewish male from around the world had to come. Well, if you were bringing two turtle doves as an offering, if you were bringing a lamb as an offering, if you were bringing a giant stubborn ox of a bull as an offering, could you imagine traveling from North Africa with a stubborn ox? So what happened was the religious leaders had a market where you could buy the animals once you got there but they had turned it into a racketeering system. Look at what Jesus does. Matthew 21, verse 22, Jesus. What does he do when he rides into Jerusalem? They thought he was going to go to the Roman soldiers and just start chopping heads off. Rome, we bow to no Caesar. I'm the king. Send that message back to Rome. You tell Caesar I'll be waiting right here, sitting right on this wall, and he can send whatever legion he wants, and me and the angels will be waiting. That's what they wanted. They're thinking, oh, yeah, Lord, go deal with the wicked Romans. Go deal with the wicked oppressive system. Go deal with them. Where's the first place Jesus goes? 1 Peter 4.17 says judgment must begin in the house of God. First place he goes is to the church. First place he goes is to the temple. And what were they doing in the temple? For the people that traveled from the then known world, they had animals that you could buy to give your offering. Praise God that Jesus is standing there knowing that in just a number of days, he will offer himself. And every blemishless, spotless, innocent animal was just a type of him, the true blemishless, innocent one who would be slaughtered for our sins. But still, he must come in. And what does he do? He cast everyone out that bought and sold in the temple. John tells us that the first time he did this years ago, he took a rope, braided it, and literally started cracking the whip at people. You see, we, we don't talk enough about who Jesus is. You say, how does Jesus feel about rebellion, it breaks his heart. How does Jesus feel when people choose hell instead of heaven? It makes him weep. How does Jesus feel? How does the Father feel about religious hypocrisy and playing church and making church into a circus? Well, let's read 
It says he cast everyone out that bought and sold in the temple, overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves, and he said to them, it is written, my house. And notice what he's doing? He just walked in the temple and called it his house. <laughs> there was a song back in the day where run and run DMC, run gets on the stage, whose house? And everyone yells, run's house. It's like in hip hop, oh my gosh, run just said it's his house. Yo, Jesus walks into the temple of God and says, my house should be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a cave of robbers. You see, this is what they would do. They would have the animals for sale, and it was a racketeering system where these religious leaders who crucified Jesus made millions of dollars, even back then, 2,000 years ago. What they would do is they would have animals, and then you traveled from North Africa or the Middle East or Yemen or wherever else, and they had a system set up where the minute you showed up, just ready to worship God, because Deuteronomy 16, 16 said you had to go there. You saved up a year's worth of earnings just to go to Jerusalem and worship. They look at your money. Oh, that is a Roman coin with Caesar on it. Oh, that is a coin from North Africa with your emperor on it. Uh, we don't worship other gods. We will not take that money. You can't buy an animal with that. Go to the money exchangers. They will exchange it into the, into the Jewish, the Hebrew shekel. Then when you go, the conversion rate was crazy and gouging, and they pocketed that money. Then you went back, and you had the animal, and they would look at the animal and say, hmm, there's a blemish on this animal. Hey, come on over here, you know, Levi, you know. Hey, do you see that, Levi? I see it too. Can't offer that one. It's blemished. You're going to have to get another one. And then the price for them was through the roof, and people came away broke and fleeced. There's nothing new under the sun when people talk about churches today that do quadruple offerings and just guilt trip people and take all their money. People walk out so broke they can't even pay their bills or get an ice cream cone for their kid once a month. Yo. It's nothing new under the sun, and Jesus hated it then, and he hates it now. He does what? He starts flipping tables. And what is he doing? He's making room for what really belongs there. His presence, his heart, his mind, his will, his spirit. Will we today celebrate a new Jesus riding into Jerusalem to go get on our cross? Because what deserves to, the, what the story should read like, in terms of what we deserve, what the story should read like is in Luke that it says, and Jesus began weeping, and you heard, and he turned the donkey around and just rode off into the sunset. I'm not, uh, <laughs> enough of them, enough of human beings. I don't do humans. Yo, he continues to ride in. Why? Because Jesus has chosen. He has laid down his life. Psalm 40, verse 7 and 8 says, Lo, I come. In the volume of the whole book, it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yeah, your law is in my heart. That was a messianic word of Jesus that he shares. He delights. He delights. It's a labor of love. Though his people grieve him, though we grieve him, it is a labor of love, and he has made himself eternally bound to us through the new covenant. And it's not a covenant that's been secured with gold and silver and money. He secured it with his own blood. He knew what he was getting into when he chose us. So even though you might feel like you're learning new things about yourself, you might reach new levels of, oh my goodness, about yourself. You might reach new levels of, oh my gosh, I can't stand myself about yourself. He knew what he was getting into when he chose you. John 15, 16, you have not chosen me, he said. I've chosen you. And he loves us with an everlasting love. So today, as we want to really prepare our hearts for Holy Week, may we see afresh him riding in, and may we erupt with praise like we haven't praised him in some time. When's the last time you've just praised God? When's the last time your conversation around the house was the goodness of God? Not just, oh, I got a raise, praise God. Oh, my food, my, do, uh, my Uber DoorDash came 20 minutes early, praise God, you know? Not that stuff. And I'm, praise God that you do praise God for that. But sometimes that could even just be a matter of, oh, let me say praise God, because I like it when I get it 20 minutes early. Maybe if I say praise God, I'll get it 30 minutes early next time. When is the last time where home was just occupied with you talking about God's goodness? with you just sharing, just with whomever. You know, did I ever tell you this 
piece of my life? Did I ever tell you what he did for me here? Did, are you sharing with your kids? I, I know you know my story, but did you ever know this detail and, and, and what he, uh, how he gave me the, the, the garments you know, of praise for a spirit of heaviness in this area of my life? Parents, instead of just giving our children lectures and just always telling them what thus saith the Lord, you know, are, are, are you, is it time maybe to come back to using your own life as an example and really sharing what he has done? But you see, you've got to, this has to be your way of thinking for that to come out of your mouth because Jesus said out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. If your heart ain't full of this, then when the rubber meets the road, you ain't going to talk about it. You find out what's near and dear to a person. If you want to know what's near and dear to a person, listen to them run their mouth. If you want to know what floats someone's boat, just let them talk for a while. Gee, you're going to know what they're in. You're going to know what floats their boat. Just listen. It's just a fact. It's time to come back to seeing our Jesus riding as the meek and lowly king. And it would be this meekness. And meekness is not weakness. It's strength under control. He will ride in and conquer the entire kingdom of darkness he will conquer death itself, the ultimate enemy. Do you know the Bible is the only book, the Christian worldview, listen up, y'all, and I'm out of your way. The Christian worldview is the only worldview that has an answer for death. We're the only ones that have an answer for this monster called death. That's why we don't care about walking under ladders. We don't care if we break mirrors. We don't care if a million black cats walk in front of our path. We were the only ones with an answer for death. Christ would ride in on a donkey. But yet, if you listen closely, he just told you that the rocks will break out in chorus if, if he allows it, if he wills it. He will go in and he will conquer death. He will pay the price for all of our sins. How many of you just think of all of your sins, every idle word you've ever shared, all your sick thoughts, all your weirdness, all your dumb actions, all your selfishness, all your blasphemies? I mean, can you, do you just start feeling heavy when you just picture that? And then picture the person to your right, to your left, not just picture the sins of the world. And he would shed his blood and pay the price so that anyone that calls on his name can be forgiven. Anyone that calls on his name can be washed whiter than new snow. Anyone who calls on his name can be made a new creature. Anyone that calls on his name can live with him forever and reign with him on the throne. Anyone, he rides in and pays the price. Meekness is hardly weakness. So let's have the palm branches distributed now. I think this would be a great time. And actually, here's a song that I love. Do we have the YouTube video ready? There's a song, and let me know if it's able to run. You know, I gave it to them last minute this morning. You know, it's all good. Is that a thumb up or a one minute? I can't tell. I'm 47 years old. My eyes aren't the best. Okay, yes, I, yeah, two thumbs. I know that. Because no one ever does two one minutes, but they do do two thumbs. Cool, thank you. Yes, I love you, Brandon. So here is a song. It's taken from Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. Um, look, Mel Gibson is just a man. He told everyone that from the beginning. But I will tell you this. God used him mightily. And we see God used Cyrus to fund the building of Nehemiah's wall. He was just a, a pagan king. God used Mel Gibson in an amazing way to put forward the Passion of the Christ. I'd encourage everyone, watch the Passion of the Christ this week. It is very, very accurate. But Mel Gibson was accurate in this. He said if he really put in the details of what really happened at the crucifixion, nobody would be able to walk through it. Nobody would be able to look at it because Isaiah prophesied that the Messiah would be shredded beyond human recognition. So if we're ready, I'm going to dim the lights. Um, is the volume good for the song? Let's make sure the volume is, is really good. Um, let's just watch this. And what he's saying in the song is he's saying, I stand in awe of you. Our Lord is riding in meek and lowly on a donkey. And he is going in to conquer everything. That's why we can hold a palm branch today. We can hold a, you, that palm branch in your hand represents that everything, evil, death, even you being your own worst enemy, 
old ways, generational strongholds, anything against you. If God before you, who could be against you? Jesus conquered it all, and that is the only reason you can hold a palm branch. Take away Jesus, take away Holy Week, and you got no reason to have a palm branch in your hand, except for joining the rest of the world and just making some abstract, hopeless hope about it. So let's watch this. Let's fall in love with it. I'm going to dim these lights. If you can just, can, can someone over here? Okay, awesome. Can you make sure these are down? Uh, no, can you do these lights right here, please? No, 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 no. The, these. And if you can click those all the way down, that's how they go off. All the way down. That's how you know they're off when you take them all the way to the, to the bottom. Everybody. Oh. That's our Jesus. 
That is our Jesus. And if you're here today, the question is, do you know him? Because he said, if you have the son, you have life. If you do not have the son, you do not have life. And it says in the scriptures, if there's any other way that men can get to heaven apart from this sacrifice, then Christ died for nothing. Died for nothing. So, again, when Jesus came the first time in Luke 2, 4, born in Bethlehem, it says there was no room in the inn. He was born in the alley. When Jesus rides into Jerusalem for his triumphal entry some 30 semi-years later, he weeps because there's no room for him. It was just churchiness, dead doctrine, and religiosity. Money changers, working tables. What, what are the tables in your heart that the Lord needs to overthrow? He's a jealous God. He bought us with his blood. He has the right to be jealous over us. What are the tables in your heart that need to be overthrown? What is the exchanging that going on in our hearts that needs to change, that we need to let him just drive out? But what I love is he drove it out. You see, the victory is him doing the work. It's not a matter of, oh, man, that message today, it got me, man. I got to drive some stuff out. No, no, he drives it out. You just give it to him. <laughs> That's why we hold the palm branches. It's not our victory. It's not because we're strong. It's because he's victorious for us. What will you give him to let him drive out? Or you can look at other things. Just the selfishness. It's just time, Lord, I'll struggle with this until the rapture, but this level of it, it's got to be, you've got to, I'm giving it to you, drive it out. Maybe it's pride. I'll struggle with pride until you call me home, Lord, but this level of pride this level of unteachableness, you've got to drive it out. Lust. Lord, it'll be a wrestling with lust until you call us home, but this level of lust, this stronghold, I give it to you. Drive it out. What needs to be driven out? What are we allowing? Your own dreams, your own ambitions. It's great to be a visionary, but now you have a dream, and you can't even say thy kingdom come because you're not willing to say your kingdom go. Lord, my kingdom that I'm trying to build, my way all the time, my dreams that I just sprinkled Jesus' name on because I learned you bless things, Lord, drive it out. Let today be a day of just welcoming him afresh into, you know, good soil, amen? Colossians 3.16, let the word of God dwell in you richly. It says, dwell in the Greek, is let it be at home in your heart. Let's, let's let the word of God be at home in our hearts in a new way. But that means a lot of thorns and a lot of things need to go. And that's where we repent. So, Father, we just thank you right now for what you're doing. And we thank you for this day. It's a day to celebrate one of the greatest moments when you rode in, which is the greatest week leading up to the greatest moment when you died for our sins and rose again. Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you that no one could have invented this Thank you for who you are. And Lord, we love you. We repent, Lord. We repent of the tables, the shops in the heart, the things, even the things that may be seemingly good in and of themselves, but they become bad things because we allow them to have the place you ought to have. We want to give up self. We want to give up things, things too big for us, things too overwhelming for us to handle. But Lord, it's not too hard for you. We ask you to drive it out. We want to create room for you in our hearts. Thank you, Lord. Because we've walked enough in this walk to know that life is the sweetest when you're the center of it. So would you come back to taking that place? You've not left us, Lord. We've left you. We've left our first love. And we come back and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.